Well, it was about 15 years ago in August of 2009 when we lived in the Phoenix metro area that I was invited to preach at a church in Peoria, Arizona, which is in the northwestern quadrant of the Phoenix metro. At the time, I was fervently seeking to re-enter into the pastoral ministry having failed at a church plant three years prior. Um, The church that I was invited to speak at also happened to be looking for a new lead pastor. And as it were, they were interested in talking to me about it and thought that I might be a good fit. They invited me to come and preach for three weeks in a row so that they can get to know me and I could get to know them and During that span of three weeks, I had the opportunity to meet with their leaders, their elders, and um, they got to ask me questions, I got to ask them questions. And I remember in those discussions, one of the main things they kept repeating was the fact that they were looking for a uh, Bible teacher, one who taught expository preaching, which I thought was great because that kind of matched my style of teaching. Well, at the end of those three weeks, I don't know, maybe in week four, week five, something like that, one afternoon I received a call from their lead pastor. I still remember his name. His name was Joe, or I should say their lead elder. Um, And I remember thinking when I saw his, you know, the caller ID on my phone, I remember thinking, like, this is it. This is going to happen. I'm going to get an invitation to be their new lead pastor. At the time, I was working a sales job in downtown Phoenix, and um, I was okay at it. I I did pretty good, but I was just not what I was called to do, not the way I was wired, and was really looking forward to getting into pastoral ministry. I'd study over nine years to to, uh, be prepared for that. And, um, you know, he, he began the conversation by telling me, like, hey, out of all the guys we've talked to, you by far are the best expository preacher. And I I remember as he's saying that, I'm like, this is it. It's going to happen. This is what I've been praying for. And as he's talking, I'm just kind of, you know, almost like on cloud nine and just enjoying the moment. And then a few sentences later, he told me that I wasn't the one that they were going to invite, that they had chosen another man and that they were thankful for my time with them, that they'd be praying for me and that. God would take me where he wanted me to be. And at the end of the conversation, he said, hey, we'll be praying for you. Thank you. And, and then he hung up. I remember thinking after that short little conversation, what, what's going on? Like I felt dazed, almost even a little numb. I remember thinking like I wanted, I wanted that position so badly. I had I had been in the ministry, I was taken out of it because the church plant didn't work, and I wanted to get back into it, and I I remember just just having this ache and urge in my heart to to re-enter the pastoral ministry. I remember asking God, like, Lord, what happened? Why didn't this work out? What did I do wrong? Why aren't you allowing me to re-enter the ministry you have called me to serve in? Well, as it turned out, what I didn't know at the time, the Lord was actually sparing me and protecting me from a lot of heartache. I found out that within a year that that church closed its doors and is no longer in existence. I never found out why or what happened, but it doesn't really matter, does it? That would have been a disaster for our young family. I would have left my job, and within a year, I would have had no job. In the providence of God, He was protecting me and and our family, and I had no idea that that was going on. Furthermore, a year later, we moved to Iowa, 
And our time in Iowa was very good for us as a family. I was able to join an elder team at a good church. Within a year of us arriving in Iowa, a couple years later, I was able to join the pastoral staff, and we planted a church out of uh, that church. I served alongside my good friend, Todd Stiles, who shared his pulpit with me that uh, first year or first couple of years I was an elder. I believe I've shared that with you before. And none of that would have happened if I had not been turned down for that role in Arizona. You see, even when we're not aware of it, the Lord is always providentially protecting us and looking out for us for our good. At times, we may not like what's going on. We may struggle with, with what's going on, but we can always trust that it is for the best. Today, we're returning to the historical account of Jacob and his time with his uncle and father-in-law, Laban. We will see today in the passage that Jacob did not have it easy during his time with Laban. But as always, God was protecting him and working everything out for his good, just as he promised. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Genesis chapter 30. As we look at Yahweh's providence, part two, in verses 25 through chapter 31. I will take questions about the message. You can text those in. The number is in your notes, which is in the bulletin. And by way of review, as we discuss the issue of providence, as you obviously you know this is part two, uh, we discussed last week on how uh, the sovereignty of God, the fact that He's in control of all things, differs from what we call His providence. And I'll put the slide up that I put up last week. If you remember, the sovereignty of God refers to the, um, God's ability and right to do whatever He pleases, right? He's God. He's the Creator. He has all the power. He has all the wisdom. He has the freedom to act as He desires. That's a reference to His sovereignty. His providence is a little bit more specific in that it refers to the purposeful exercise of God's sovereignty. In other words, God, when He sovereignly acts, there is always purpose to His actions. We refer to that as His providence. And if you remember, we discussed how that's important to keep in mind when we face life, when we face difficulties, struggles, and pains, and fears, because we can easily forget that there is any purpose in those difficult times. We talked about how when, strage excuse me, when tragedy strikes, those times can not only be used by God, but they're actually designed by Him for our good in His providence to accomplish his will. Therefore, providence is what comforts and encourages us in the midst of our doubts, failures, and pains, that there is purpose in them and that God is at work. If we remember, His providence and the experience of His providence also strengthen our trust or our faith and dependence upon Him because we can look back to what he had done in his providence in the past, and it helps encourage us to face the present, knowing that in his providence, God will and is working things out for his glory and our good. In fact, another passage of Scripture, last week we looked at Acts 4. Here is another example of his providence in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. As Peter is preaching to those Jews on the day of Pentecost, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So through the very act of murdering the Son of God who came down from heaven in order to purchase redemption for His people, God was providentially at work in the midst of their evil. His providence accomplished our redemption. So when we refer to the providence of God, 
we are talking about God being purposeful and even masterful in the exercise of his sovereignty. Now, that's all review. Let's jump into Providence uh, Part 2 in chapter 30 of Genesis, beginning in verse 25. Here's what is written for us. Now it happened when Rachel had borne Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own place and to my own land. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go. For you yourself know my service which I have rendered you. But Laban said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, stay with me. I have interpreted an omen that Yahweh has blessed me on your account. And he continued to say, name, your, name me your wages and I will give it. But he, that is Jacob, said to him, you yourself know how I have served you and how your livestock have fared with me. For you had little before I came, but it has spread out to a multitude and Yahweh has blessed you at every step of mine. But now, when shall I provide for my own household also? So he, that is Laban, said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this one thing for me, I will again pasture and keep you, your flock. Let me pass through your entire flock today, removing from every speckled and spotted, spotted sheep and every black one among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and such shall be my wages. So my righteousness will answer for me later, when you come concerning my wages, every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, will considered, be considered stolen. And Laban said, Behold, it, let it be according to your word. So he removed on that day the striped and spotted male goats and all the speckled and spotted female goats, every one with white in it and all the black ones among the sheep, and gave them into the care of his sons." So he put a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob was pasturing the rest of Laban's flocks. Then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plane trees, and he peeled white stripes in them, exposing the white which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he peeled in front of the flocks in the trough, that is, in the watering channels where the flocks came to drink. And they mated when they came to drink. So the flocks mated by the rods, and the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs, and he made the flocks face toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban, and he set his own herds apart and did not set them with Laban's flock. Now it would be that whenever the stronger of the flock were mating, Jacob would place the rods in the side of the flock in the trough so that they might mate by the rods. But when the flock was feeble, he did not put them in, so the feebler were Laban's, and the stronger Jacob's. So the man spread out exceedingly and had large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. Lord, as we consider the, these words, may you open our eyes to the truth that we might perceive what is going on and that we might learn from it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the section I just read is what I would call providential compensation for Jacob's 14 years of labor to Laban, his uncle and father-in-law. Jacob's 11th, when Jacob's 11th son Joseph was born, it was the 14th year of his service. That's what verse 25 is referring to. As agreed upon with Laban, Jacob asks for his wives and his sons, that he may leave and go back to his own land after having served him faithfully. We learned last week that the way Jacob served Laban was that he shepherded, tended, cared for all of Laban's flocks. That's how he served him for his two wives, Rachel and Leah. Being that Lake, or excuse me, that Jacob was a good shepherd, and the fact that Yahweh was with him, we just read Laban's flocks multiplied and flourished under Jacob's care. And by this time, Laban had become a very wealthy man because of his flocks. We learned in verse 
verses 29 through 30, that when Jacob started, they were small, but at the end of the 14 years, they were large. Not only this, Laban knew that the reason he had increased in wealth through his flocks was because of Jacob having been blessed by Yahweh, right? We are not told exactly what the omen was that he interpreted that we read about in verse 27, but maybe it was a dream. We don't know. The text doesn't tell us. It just says an omen, but at the very least, Yahweh, God, had communicated to Laban like, hey, the reason you're rich is because of my servant Jacob. And there's no surprise to that, right? Part of the Abrahamic covenant of which Jacob was the heir said that I will bless those who bless you. So Laban was benefiting from that, right? He had brought Jacob into his family and had cared for him, given him his wives. And so in turn, Yahweh was blessing Laban through Jacob in fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, at that point, Laban should have just been weary of taking advantage of Jacob. But as we read, and we'll continue to read, his greed got the better of him. When Laban asks, as we read, hey, what should I pay you then? You've served me 14 years. What should your wages, your compensation be? Jacob's uh, request, basically, he said, hey, I want all the speckled, spotted, and black animals of the flocks, of the sheep and the goats. Now, this was more than a generous offer by Jacob. Laban, having just increased in wealth, through Jacob, Jacob actually had the right to ask for more. And the reason we say that is because the speckled and the spotted and the black sheep, they would have been in the vast minority of the flocks. In other words, only few of them were colored like this. Most of them would have had pure coats. So in other words, Jacob's offer was very generous. Like, hey, just give me a very little and you can keep the majority of what you have gained through the blessing of Yahweh through me and my shepherding of your flocks. In other words, the deal heavily favored Laban. So Laban's like, yeah, sure, yeah, let's do that. That's a good idea. But as we read, he did not trust Jacob. He said he's that he removed all the striped, spotted male and speckled and black and had his sons remove them and then put three days' journey between Jacob's compensation, his wages, and his own flocks would have been of pure coats. In other words, not only did he agree to this lopsided deal with Jacob that favored himself, Laban stacked the deck even higher against Jacob. Like, hey, yeah, let's remove them now and let's make sure they're nowhere near my flocks. That way, the rest of the six years that you stay, my will continue to increase and you'll get your little flocks that are spotted, speckled, and black. That's what's going on. Laban, again, is trying to take advantage of Jacob. But as we just read, it didn't work out that way, did it? Jacob placed essentially spotted and speckled branches next to, in front of the pure coat animals of Laban, right? Because we know that at this point, when they're separated, he still continues to take care of Laban's flocks. And... So that when they were mating, the offspring would be the colored kind and not the pure coat kind. In this way, Jacob planned to increase his animals from Laban's flocks. Because as the deal stipulated, hey, if they're speckled, spotted, or black, they belong to Jacob. Well, the belief in the ancient Near East was that the lambs born in the fall were stronger and the ones born in the spring were weaker. So when he says that when he did it, when the the strong ones came... It was the ones born in the fall, and he placed these striped branches in front of the stronger ones so that his flocks would not only increase, but increase from the stronger line of the animals or the stronger stock. Well, this takes place over six years. What we just read, the span of that is six years. And being that the, the way they measured wealth in the ancient Near East, Jacob was able to acquire a mass amount of wealth, as we are told that he, after the six years, spread out exceedingly and had large flocks, so much so 
that he also had acquired female and male servants as well as camels and donkeys. So Jacob had become very wealthy. Now, no doubt the reason Jacob's scheme was successful was because Yahweh, God, was looking out for him. He was taking care of Jacob, right? Jacob will even attest to this in the next chapter, saying that this is why it happened, because God was watching out for me. However, the question becomes, was he increasing in wealth because of his plan and Yahweh just blessed his scheme? Or was it the fact that Yahweh told him to put the striped branches in front of the animals? Well, let's keep reading and we'll see what the answer is to that question. Chapter 31, verse 1. Then Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob has taken away all that belonged to our father, and from what belonged to our father he has made all his wealth. And Jacob saw the face of Laban, and behold, it was not friendly toward him as formerly. Then Yahweh said to Jacob, Return to, your land, to the land of your fathers and to your kin, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to his flock in the field, and he said to them, I see your father's face, that it was not friendly toward me as formerly, but the God of my father has been with me. You also know that I have served your father with all my power, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. However, God did not allow him to harm me. If he spoke thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flock bore speckled. And if he spoke thus, the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. Thus, God has delivered your father's flocks, livestock, and given them to me. Now, it happened at the time when the flock were mating that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the male goats which were mating were striped, speckled, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. He said, lift up now your eyes and see that all the male goats which are mating are striped, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your kin. Then Rachel and Leah said to him, Do we still have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Are not we counted by him as foreigners? Yet he has sold us and has also entirely consumed our purchase price. Surely all the riches which God has delivered over to us from our father belong to us and our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. Well, as we just read, Jacob's wealth doesn't go unnoticed, right? Laban's sons see what's going on, and they become envious and jealous and even angry. And who does this guy think he is? He came here with nothing. Look at now he has more wealth than our father, and the way he gained it was through our father's flocks. They weren't happy. Even though Laban had stacked, against, stacked the deck against Jacob, Jacob still prospered, and they were pretty ticked off about it, and Jacob could see it. This meant it was time to go, which is why Yahweh told him that, like, hey, it's time to leave. It's time to return to the promised land, to Canaan. We don't know how God communicated that to Jacob, probably because we see in other parts of the passage, probably through a dream or a vision. Either way, Jacob understood it was time to go. Before leaving, he calls his wives to him out in the fields where he is still working and told them what was going on. He begins to explain to them why it was time to leave. And as he's explaining to them why it's time to leave, we learn a lot about Jacob and how he views how everything is going right? We learned that Jacob knew for certain that it was God who was protecting him. God was the one increasing his wealth and blessing him. In other words, he doesn't credit his scheme. He doesn't credit his ingenuity. He credits Yahweh taking care of him. The reason he was successful, because Yahweh, his God, blessed him. In verse 9, we see the phrase, God delivered your father's livestock and given them to me. That phrase is very telling, very informative. It means that Jacob rightly understood that Yahweh had given him his wealth, not his scheme. In fact, the way that that's written, it, it, it lends to the idea that the animals were actually belonged to Jacob, 
But Laban wouldn't give them, so God delivered the right animals that were rightly Jacob's to him. Then there's this vision that he informs his wives of, uh, his wives of, that was given to him. Which, if you look at verse 12, you see the phrase where it says, I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. In the original Hebrew, that phrase communicates that the vision came before the scheme, not after. In other words, you know, there's two views on this, that Jacob was given the dream after he had increased in wealth or before he actually did it. But if you look at the original language, it communicates that God is saying, hey, I, I can see what has been taking place. Therefore, do what I command you to do. In other words, this scheme was not Jacob's. It could very much be that God was telling Jacob to do that. Some think it was Jacob was acting on an ancient Near Eastern superstition, that if, you, if whatever the, the, the animals saw while they're mating, that's the color of their coats, right? And Yahweh just happens to bless Jacob as he's acting as, on a superstition. However, God did not bless Rachel and her acting on a superstition. Remember from the previous passage? Hey, let me, let me eat some of those, those mandrake, uh, you know, apples that your son Reuben has gathered, Leah, so that I might conceive. That was the superstition of the day. God didn't bless that superstition. So it makes sense that he didn't bless a superstition here either. It seems more likely that Yahweh had told Jacob, like, hey, just do what I tell you to do, and don't worry, I'll take care of it. Put those striped branches in front of the flocks, and in faith, Jacob obeys, and God blesses him for it. All that to say, I believe the scheme was Yahweh's all along, and now, now he's telling Jacob it's time to leave. Well, as we read, his, the, the wives agree that, yeah, our dad's been taking advantage of you. It's time to go. Let, whatever God has commanded you, let's go. He's the one who's blessed you. It's time to go. Well, let's see what happens next. Then Jacob arose, verse 17 of chapter 31, and put his children and his wives upon camels and drove them away all his livestock and all his possessions which he had accumulated, his acquired livestock which he had accumulated in Padan and Aram, in order to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Now Laban had gone to shear his flock. Then Rachel stole the household idols that were her father's, and Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he was fleeing. So he fled with all that he had, and he arose and crossed the river, and he set his faith toward the hill country of Gilead. Then it was told to Laban on the third day that like Jacob had fled. So he took his relatives with him and pursued him a distance of seven days' journey, and he overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. And God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream out of the night and said to him, Beware, lest you speak to Jacob, either good or bad. So Laban caught up with Jacob, and now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his relatives camped in the hill country of Gilead. Then Laban said to Jacob, What have you done by deceiving me and carrying away my daughters like captives of, of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and not tell me, so that I might have sent you away with gladness and with songs and with tambourine and with lyre? And not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have acted foolishly. It is in my hand to do evil against you. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Beware of speaking either good or evil to Jacob. So now you have indeed gone away, because you long greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Then Jacob answered and said to Laban, Well, because I was afraid, because I said, Lest you take your daughters from me by force. The one with whom you find your gods shall not live in the presence of our relatives. Recognize what is yours among my belongings and take it for yourself. But Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and to the tent of the two maidservants. And he did not find them. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household idols and put them in the camel's saddle. And she sat on them and Laban felt through all the tent but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is upon me. So he searched but did not find the household idols. 
Then Jacob became angry and contended with Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my transgression? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? Though you have not felt through all my goods, what have you found of uh, your household goods? Place it here before my relatives and your relatives that they may decide between us too. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten the rams of your flocks. That which was torn of beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. You required of my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was. By day heat consumed me and frost by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years I have been in your house. I have served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the dread of Isaac had not had not been for me, surely you would have sent me away empty. God has seen my affliction and the toil of my hands, and he rendered the decision last night. Well, in the last section, we observed that Yahweh's providential compensation was to give him an increased wealth through Laban's flocks. Here we see his providential protection. Providential protection. Right? Jacob packs up all his wealth. Plans to leave Haran, which is in the north of Israel, or north of Canaan. He heads south with all that he had, all his flocks and all his children, all his wives. Jacob's, as we can see so far already, he, he's a man of faith. He trusts in Yahweh. But his faith is still flawed, right? He's still a sinner. He deceives Laban, right? He should have trusted in Yahweh to protect him from Laban, but yet he still comes up with this other scheme. We also learn that his wife Rachel steals the household gods of Laban, what are known as the teraphim. From that, we learn that Laban was a polytheist, meaning he worshiped many gods. He did worship Yahweh, the God of Jacob, but he didn't worship him alone. He worshiped other gods, right? Now, we're not told why Rachel stole these teraphim, these household idols. The text doesn't tell us. But it is more than likely that in this day and age that the practice of passing down the family wealth or the inheritance, the way that you would make a claim that it was actually legally your right to inherit the wealth is that you possessed the family's household gods. So it, what probably is going on here is that Rachel has plan B. If Laban overtakes us, I'll have the household gods and I'll still have a claim to my father's wealth. She, like her husband Jacob, had faith in Yahweh, but it was a flawed faith. Jacob gets a three-day start, yet Laban catches up with him within seven days. By this time, they had arrived in northern Canaan and in the area of Gilead. God warns Laban like, hey, be careful about what you say to Jacob. In other words, he's under my protection, is what Yahweh tells Laban, right? He confronts Jacob, why did you deceive me? As though he was innocent, right? That's kind of like the pot calling the kettle black. Why did you deceive me? Well, you ever think it was because you had been deceiving him? He had been just as deceptive as Jacob was. In fact, my opinion, even more deceptive than Jacob at this point. He even, you know, is a false or, you know, an empty threat. He says, you know, it, it, it is in my hand to do evil against you. In other words, I can, I can totally crush you right now if I wanted to. It's an empty threat, right? He's already been told, hey, don't touch him. But, and he makes himself to be the innocent guy. Why are you deceiving me? You know, I would have thrown a celebration for you. We would have had a feast. I would have kissed you and said goodbye which he probably had no intention of doing. What did the text tell us earlier? That he was ticked off at Jacob. Yet, he can't do anything to him. Yahweh warns him. But there is the matter of these teraphim, these household gods. Jacob doesn't know who stole them. So he says, hey, if you find them, we'll put to death whoever has them. Well, in an attempt to save her own skin, Rachel sits on them so that they're not found. And she makes up an excuse like, oh, I can't get up because it's the time of month for my menstrual cycle. He believes her and she survives. Then Jacob gets angry. 
It's like, look, at you looked, you didn't find anything. Why are you accusing me? Why are you coming after me? Why are you trying to deceive me again? He recounts to Laban, look at how faithfully I've served you. Look at how your wealth has increased. You've tried to change my wages 10 times. More than likely, when, as the, 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 the animals were being born, if they were all spotted, from what he said earlier, hey, you know what? Let's not give you the spotted now. Let's just give you the, 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 you know, the speckled. Okay. And then all of a sudden, all the animals were speckled. And Laban goes, no, let's go back to the spotted rather than, you know, and Jacob still increased anyway. He's like, why have you treated me this way? And he ends by saying, look at the reason why I have grown wealthy, even though you've deceived me, is because Yahweh, my God, made it so. In other words, he has blessed me, and now he has cursed you because you tried to deceive me, right? And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. God is fulfilling his promise to Abraham. Yahweh protected Jacob. Yahweh looked out for him. Well, let's finish the chapter real quick, and then that way we can talk about what we can learn. Verse 43, then Laban answered and said to Jacob, the daughters of are my daughters and the children are my children and the flocks are my flocks and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these daughters of mine and their children whom they have born? So now come, let us cut a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. Then Jacob took a stone and raised up a pillar. And Jacob said to his relatives, gather stones. So they took stones, made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. And Laban called it Jagur Shadutha, but Jacob called it Galid. Then Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, it was named Galid and Mizpah, for he said, may Yahweh watch between you and me where we are absent from one another. If you afflict my daughters or if you take wives besides my daughters, although no man is to see, God is witness between you and me. And Laban said to Jacob, behold this heap and behold the pillar that I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness and the pillar is a witness that I will not pass by this heap to uh, to you for harm, and you will not pass by this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob swore by the dread of his father Isaac. Then Isaac offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called, excuse me, then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his relatives to eat a meal, and they ate the meal and spent the night on the mountain. And Laban arose early in the morning and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. Laban can't do anything to Jacob. He's angry, he's frustrated, but he knows he can't do anything. So he makes a covenant with Jacob. Sadly, even though they were family, they had become enemies. They agreed to, that there would be no more conflict. Laban attempts to portray himself as the righteous one, although we know he's not, right? In reality, this covenant that he makes with Jacob, he's protecting himself. He can see for sure that Yahweh's blessing is upon Jacob, therefore he's protecting himself. Well, they have the customary meal. He says goodbye to his family, his grandsons, his daughters, and then Jacob thus had returned to the promised land of Canaan. God had blessed him with wealth, many sons who would later be the tribes or the fathers of the tribes of Israel. God is and was fulfilling his word to Jacob that he promised. Well, we'll pick it up next week in chapter 32, but for now, the remainder of our time, I want to address two truths concerning Yahweh's providence in this passage that we have covered. And the first one is simply the fact that on occasion, providence is undeniably supernatural. However, it is normally subtle and requires faith to see. This is what I mean by this. There's no doubt, no doubt Yahweh had been protecting and providing for Jacob during his time with Laban. It's very clear. God is the one protecting and increasing his wealth, right? He multiplies it, becomes greater than Laban's. Yahweh had spoken to Jacob before he even gets to Haran, says, hey, I will be with you and I will bring you back. And it was time to leave. God again returns to him, says, hey, it's time for you to come home. He even gave Jacob a vision on what to do, on how to increase the wealth. He also warns Laban in a dream, don't touch, don't touch Jacob, he's under my protection. All of these are undeniable acts of Yahweh's providence. In all of these instances, it is undeniable that God is purposefully exercising His sovereignty on behalf of Jacob to accomplish His will. 
we could even say that these are supernatural or miraculous acts of providence. They're undeniable. Now, even though God does and can act supernaturally through miracles, visions, and dreams, more often than not, His providence is more subtle. Most of the time, like when Jacob was working hard in the flocks, tending, taking care of Laban's flocks, the providence of God is seen in the ordinary acts and events of life. Jacob had four wives, and over the span of seven years, he receives 11 sons. Over the course of the six years, through the normal everyday conception, birth, and growth of the animals, his wealth began to increase. It wasn't miraculous in one moment. It was just through everyday normal acts. These types of ordinary circumstances, or we might even say means, are not as miraculous as a vision or as a dream, but they are nonetheless still the providence of God. God's providence, most of the time, is subtle and not always immediately recognizable. However, for we, people of faith, who have placed our trust in God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we know and believe and submit to the fact that in all things, God is in control and is providentially working out things for His honor and our good. Right? We see that and trust that by faith. So the reason I even address this issue is because I don't want us to be always expecting a miracle or, or, or a vision or a dream. Of course God can do miracles. No one denies that. It's undeniable, right? He's God. He spoke the worlds into existence. Can He do the miraculous? Of course He can. However, most of the time He provides for us and acts on our behalf in just simple ordinary, everyday ways. The way He speaks to us, the primary way, is through His Word. We must place our trust in Him, knowing that He will provide and protect, protect us through ordinary means. What seems to others to be chance or good luck are actually the providence of God. And when, by faith, we recognize it, we should thank and praise Him for it, right? Rather than expect God to speak to us all the time in visions or dreams, we must trust and obey what He has already spoken to us in His Word. Now, you might say, well, that's not how He spoke to Abraham. That's not how He spoke to Isaac or Jacob. True. But we have to remember that at during the time that they lived, they didn't have the law, they didn't have the prophets, they didn't have the Psalms or the writings, right? At that time, there was no written word of God, which, which meant in order to speak to them, he had to speak to them directly. However, also in the providence of God, God wrote his word using men to speak through the Holy Spirit, right? Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 through 21, which we now have in our hands in the Bible. If you want to hear from God, well, you've heard me say this before, read His Word. Read it, study it, understand it, then he will, and He will speak to you through His Word, which is, what does the Bible say about itself? It's living, it's active, right? It's like a two-edged sword, able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. So, on occasion, providence is undeniably supernatural. We don't deny that. However, it is normally subtle and requires faith to see. We also learn from providence that God is not only always aware of when we are mistreated, He also uses our mistreatment for our good. We learn that Yahweh was well aware and even watchful of what was taking place in Jacob's life. Right? He was intimately aware of what Laban was trying to do to Jacob and cheating him of his rightful wages. And He wanted Jacob to know that. Right? He goes, hey, I, I have seen, I know, I, I am intimately aware of what's going on in your life. However, there was a lot of time between Laban's ongoing deception to when Yahweh tells Jacob that he knows. Right? He had to endure a lot before hearing from God. 
Put simply, Jacob had to wait six years to hear that Yahweh was aware, even though there was never a time when he was not aware. We must never forget the fact that God is always carefully and providentially looking out for us. And this is critical to remember when we are being mistreated by others, when life doesn't seem to go our way or the way we want it to. We must not act like Rachel and take matters into our own hands or like Jacob who deceived Laban because he was afraid of him. When we are mistreated, God's will for us is to persevere and to do the right thing. Second or First Peter chapter 2. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unrighteously. For what credit is there if when you sin or are harshly treated, you endure? But if when you endure good, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this finds favor with God. This finds favor because it means we trust Him. It means that we trust Him and we trust in His providence, that He is taking care of us, that He will provide for us, that He's protecting us. Not only this, He uses our mistreatment by others for our good. Right? When you suffer unjustly, it forces you to draw near to God. And trust Him. It teaches us to realize, to know, to understand, to experience the fact that man's approval means nothing. It doesn't matter what people think of you. What matters is what what does God think of you, right? And if you're a child of God in Christ, if you've been accepted in the Beloved because of your faith in the Son, you have been justified, you have been reconciled, and nothing can separate you from the love of God. Who cares what people think? It teaches us when people mistreat us to long for eternity, when we will be free from this life of pain, disappointment, death, betrayal, evil, and even sinful urges. Yes, it's not easy to be mistreated. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it's painful but it will not last forever. At times, difficult circumstances will lead you to the next chapter of your life, which is for your good, right? Laban's opposition and sin against Jacob led Jacob back to the promised land. He was being mistreated and God used it to send Jacob home for his good. Like I told you earlier, my struggle in Phoenix led me to Iowa. If I was not led to Iowa, I never would have joined First Family Church, and I never would have become one of their their elders and later a church planter. It was good for me and my family, as I told you. Even the hard times, when I was struggling, when I hated what I was doing, when I hated doing a sales job and wanted to preach and I wanted to be a pastor, when I eventually got the opportunity, I was much more appreciative of what God had given me. The hard times taught me that. Then there is what Paul wrote in Romans 12, and we'll end with this. Turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Romans 12, verse 17. In regards to when we are mistreated, Paul wrote this, never paying back evil for evil to anyone, respecting what is good in the sight of all men, if possible, so as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men, never taking your own revenge, beloved, instead leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in doing so you will Keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We must always learn to trust in the Lord and not return evil for evil. I don't know about you, but this is a hard, that's a hard thing to do for me. When people attack me, when they say things about me, when they slander me, I, wanna, I want revenge. I want to answer. 
Even at times, I, I've told you before, I want to get physical. How dare you talk to me that way? How, how dare you treat me that way? Yet what I can do and what God can do are not the same, are they? The same goes for you. God is the judge, not us. We are called to respond in godliness to those who mistreat us, even when it is difficult to endure trust in the providence of God and that He will use it for our good. Let us trust and allow Him to take care of those who are mistreating us. Let that guide and dictate our actions. May it dictate and guide our thoughts as well as our words to not respond in kind. It doesn't mean that the way people mistreat us is okay. It's not like we can just brush it under the carpet and be like, oh, that's no big deal. No, it is a big deal. Sin is destructive. It's painful. It hurts. It just means that, hey, we're not God. Let's pull back and let Him be God and take care of those who mistreat us. So, Again, Yahweh's providence teaches us that He not only is in control of all things, but He has purpose in all things. All things. Amen? Were there any questions? Yeah? Oh, we got a bunch. Let's put them up there. Does God still speak to people in dreams? I'd have to say yes. I've never had it happen to me, but, you know, the report that I hear of going on in the Middle East a lot, and, and, and I'm the only, you know, there's a lot of uh, examples of this, or in, 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 in specifically in, in Islamic countries, where you hear people have dreams of a man in white, or Isa talks to them in a dream, and either tells them, go read the Bible or go talk to this person who'll give you a Bible. I, I think those are legitimate. Absolutely. Beyond that, yeah, I still think he does. But you go back to, remember, when, how do you know the Holy Spirit's talking to you? You still use that criteria. How do you know it's God, right? Does it contradict his word? You know, all, remember all those, that checklist? I would use that to know if whether the dream you're having is from God or not. You know, kind of as a, uh, kind of as a seatbelt that we don't kind of think every, every little dream is from God, if that makes sense. So, so yeah, I, I think he can, and I think he still does. So, by the way, that's in fulfillment of Joel 2 that, he, that Peter quotes in Acts 2. Your young men, women and men will see visions and dream dreams. So, yeah, I think that's still possible. Next. Is it possible to place ourselves outside of God's providence through our disobedience? Nope. You cannot escape the providence of God. Even in your disobedience, He is working things out for your good if you are His. And if you're not His, He is still working things out for His good and His glory because you will be judged for your disobedience. No, you cannot escape the absolute sovereignty and providence of God. It's impossible. You can't do it, right? Satan tried to thwart God's plan like he goes from two different ways. Hey, through Peter, don't go to the cross because I think that might be bad for me. And then he fills Judas. Hey, go to the cross, betray him. You can't thwart the providence of God. It's impossible. So, but I, you can make your life more difficult. <laughs> I can tell you that, right? If you're his and he loves you, he chastises those whom he loves. Even though Jacob fled Laban because God told him to, God didn't tell him to do so deceptively. Correct. Why would he do that and God not help him realize that he was wrong? Or was it okay in God's eyes just like intentionally mating the flock so Jacob would get the stronger? Well, like I told you, I believe the, whole, the, the scheme, if you wanted the plan to, as the flocks were mating, I believe that was told to him by God. But the fact that he deceived Laban, you're like, why doesn't he warn him? Why doesn't he chastise him? The history of Jacob's not over. It's, and it's, it's, there, there are, the, the highs are very high, but the lows are very low, and it's not over. Remember what we talked about before, that Jacob received retribution for his sins, right? There was consequences for his sins. He was forgiven, but he had to live with the consequences of his actions. It's not over. You're going to see. The deception in Jacob's family is not over, and he pays the price. So, 
That's how I'd answer that. Is there one more? Is God's providence and divine favor the same? So his divine favor is that he favors you, protects you, right? And the way that that, the way we would explain how does that play out, it's in his providence, right? God purposefully exercising his sovereignty on our behalf. So yeah, that's for our favor. By the way, neither of them can be earned. They are given, right? God's actions for our good on our behalf are by grace, not works. Works are merely a response to grace. Obedience is a response, a love response to the love that has been given to us in Christ. No one can earn God's favor. So I think it's important to remember that. Well, those, those are very good questions you guys are thinking. I love it. We're, we're going to continue to pick it up next week. But as the band comes, the music team comes to the platform, we're going to get ready for a time of remembering and focusing on the Lord Jesus, who, in the providence of God, was sent into time, space, and history, the timeless one, the eternal one, in the providence of God, in the midst of a time when his people, Israel, was under the domination of a foreign power, Rome. God providentially leads Caesar Augustus to require a census of the Roman Empire. Caesar's freely acting of his own will. And yet God providentially uses it to send Joseph, the son of David, to his home place of Bethlehem so that when the Son of God enters into the world, he would fulfill the prophecy that the Messiah would indeed come from Bethlehem. And then all the acts that happened in the life of Jesus and all the events as Satan tries to oppose him could not thwart the providence of God because it ended in, or it led to his death and then resurrection and eventually his ascension and return back to heaven. Jesus is, you want to see the clearest picture of God's providence? Look at the cross. Nothing could stop God from fulfilling his promise, which began all the way back in Genesis 3. Remember? The seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Lord Jesus, thank you for all that you do for us, all that you mean to us. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who not only trust you for our salvation, but who trust you for everything, every, everything in our lives whether we talk about who we're going to marry or what job we're going to take or what decisions we make within our family in the home or the workplace or even here in the church. May we trust in your sovereign providence. Thank you for sending Christ. May we honor him now. Amen.